Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas, and we are going through the entire book of Revelation, and we're breaking it down. We're going through it slowly, uh, little pieces at a time, segment here, segment there, you know, a couple minutes, 10 minutes tops. And so you're more than welcome to go back and start from the beginning. Uh, you can also pick it up right here. We're in Revelation chapter 14. We're starting at the top. This is John's vision, right? This is John's vision of heaven. He's seeing uh, the throne room. He's seeing the end times. He's seeing all the events that lead up to uh, the second coming of Christ and uh, the, all, the, all the bad that happens in the earth and all the good. He's jotting it all down. He's writing it all down. This is his revelation, right? This is his revelation of end times. And we just got through reading Revelation chapter 13, which was all about the mark of the beast and the false prophet. And now we're heading into Revelation chapter 14. Verse 1 says, Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So what do we see? We see this juxtaposition between Revelation 13 and Revelation 14. Revelation 13, all about uh, those who follow the beast, right? Those who all wear the mark of the beast, those who all follow the false prophet. So Revelation 14 begins with, and in this corner, right? <laughs> it's, here's, here's, here's the one corner, you know, here's the opponent, and in this corner is Christ. And with Christ stands 144,000, and symbolically, it says that they don't wear the mark of the beast. They don't self-identify with the world or with evil. Rather, they identify with Christ. They wear his mark, it says. Verse 2 says, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Did you catch all of that? There's some really fantastic imagery in there. It starts with verse 2. Uh, harp players and music that is coming from the throne room. And this heavenly music, this heavenly choir is so loud that it sounds like thunder. Can you imagine a heavenly choir? Can you imagine even harpists playing that loudly with that intensity that it sounds like thunder and they are all singing a song. They're all singing the song before the throne of God. And it kind of takes you back to those first chapters of Revelation that we read where uh, the, the creatures were around the throne room and they were singing praises to God. So this is a magnificent scene. And when it talks about the followers of God, it talks about their purity, right? It does specifically mention uh, women, but you know that would be some sort of a immoral relationship. That wouldn't be the relationship between a, a husband and wife. But I think more so when it talks about them being virgins, um, it's not talking about a sexual purity. This is talking about these people are set aside. You know, they have kept themselves pure in the relationship between God and humanity. These are people who have not uh, cheated on God, right? These are people that have not taken the mark of the beast. They have not followed the one whose number is 666. They have not succumb to the pressures of the world to be like everybody else, to receive the mark that allows them to buy and trade. These people have stayed true and faithful to God. In fact, verse 5 says, and in their mouth no lie was found and they were blameless. You know, when we think about all the other areas of our life where we try to remove sin from or things that we feel are darkness to us or burden to us, how often do we think that even just controlling our tongue 
controlling the things that come out of our mouth are just as important, so important that it's mentioned here at the end of Revelation to describe those who follow Jesus. I don't think anything better could be said of this group. Plus, it says that they're a, a sacrifice. You see that? It says that they're, they're first fruits, meaning that they're the best. That's what first fruits would mean. They're, these are the best. They're the cream of the crop. That if they were a sacrifice, if these people were a sacrifice, they would be the unblemished ones, the ones without spot, the ones that are perfect. These are the ones that would be offered up to God. Like I said, nothing better can be said about this 144,000. You know, back in um, Matthew 16, Jesus asked Peter, he said, who do, you, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus said, blessed are you. And, and he said, the flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You know, the world did not reveal this to you, but this was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. He says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. This, this is the foundation of the church. This is the foundation of that 144,000 in the future, that, that these will be people that stand firm for Christ and do not sway, like a rock, like a stone, that it doesn't matter what comes our way. It doesn't matter what year it is. Right? It doesn't matter what time we are living in, what day and age, what technology exists. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The church is called to be the rock that stands firm, that doesn't sway, that is blameless, that is the first fruits, that no lie come from our lips, that we stay pure, that we are devoted to Christ and nobody else. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if we live in time of blessing or triumph or despair or loss. The church is job is to be the first fruits. It's our job to be blameless and pure and spotless with no lie on our lips and only devotion to God in our hearts. And when Jesus returns, he should see the church holding his banner and nobody else's. Thanks for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.